today we're in John 14. Now, John 14 uh, has what I consider to be one of the most concise and also confronting statements in Scripture, to be honest. In verse 6, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now, that statement was in response to an incredibly honest guy named Thomas, who says to our Lord, we haven't got a clue where you're going. So how in the world could we possibly know the way to get there? And Jesus' reaction to this honesty from a faithful follower is to reveal more about himself. And thankfully, we receive the benefit of Thomas's honesty. In response to Thomas's query regarding the way, Jesus reveals, of course, that he is the way. Now, I, I suspect there was every chance that Thomas was trying to figure out which road he would have to take to get to the place that Jesus was talking about. Whereas, you know, he's going, well, hang on, all the roads lead to Rome, but we're not, you know, that's you now. But Jesus is talking about his kingdom, which is yet to be fully revealed. And the way to get to that kingdom, of course, is Jesus himself. Uh, this idea, of course, him being the way was, was at the heart of the early Christian mindset. And they often, they call themselves the people of the way. You know? And I actually love that, people of the way. Because what's the response to you go, oh, I'm a person of the way. Which way? <laughs> Which way? What way? You know, thank you. Let me tell you about Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely, um, you know, descriptive, you know. As opposed to if you say, I'm a Christian, people go, oh. But a way? Wait, which way? Well, actually, the only way, and that's Jesus. It, it, and the, the very fact that he is the way in which we can get to eternal life, to, to a relationship, the eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is the way that we actually, you know, can come into that relationship is really liberating because it's what he is and, and, and who he is that helps us get there, not what I am, who I am, or what I've done that gets me there. I'm suddenly set free from trying to earn, earn my way you know, to God. You know, the wonderful thing is Jesus is not a toll way. You don't have to pay as you go along. He's paid it. And he says, I'm the way to life with our Heavenly Father, with God in heaven. But not only is he the way, he's also the truth and the life. Uh, he's truth because he's the living one revealing God. You know, John says that the word who is God, who became human, the one who's defined as unfaith, unfailing love and faithfulness, that's him. He is the truth teller, the truth revealer. In him is the truth, and he is the truth. You know, if you want a truthful saying, a trustworthy saying, look at what Jesus has to say. And also, he's the life. Uh, and God has granted him the life-giving power, uh, five, uh, John 5, 26. So that whoever he gives life to will have life. And only by believing in Jesus can eternal life be found. You know, it, that's certainly a strong theme. Jesus is the truth teller and the life giver. And even more, he is truth and life. And for this reason, he says, no one can come to the Father except through him. Uh, there was a uh, 15th century Augustan priest, Thomas Akempis, who said, 
Without the way, there is no going. This is a bit of a song you might think about. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. Yeah. We need Jesus. And Jesus is the only, only way to a Heavenly Father. Now, of course, uh, this is a little bit offensive. In fact, it can be highly offensive um, you know, to some people, actually to a lot of people. And they'd find the Christian message is oppressive because it dares to say Jesus is the only way to eternal life, especially in our, our culture where, you know, there's lot, hey, all views are valid. Uh, and so then you come along and say, well, no, there's only one way to get to eternal life, to, 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 to get to heaven. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, they would say it speaks of intolerance, this statement. They would say that it's exclusivity. In other words, you're creating an exclusive group. And, and some would even consider it arrogant to think that there's only one path to God in eternal life. You know, and... Um, well, uh, yes, it, it is exclusive. Um, yes, it, it is saying one way. Uh, I'm not saying one way. Um, Jesus is saying he's the only way. Now, to be fair, Christians have at times used this verse in a very arrogant way to belittle others and their belief. Uh, you're wrong. You know, your beliefs are foolish. Um, uh, yes, they, their thinking may be incorrect. In fact, I would say their thinking is incorrect. Uh, and they may be acting a bit foolishly, but that's, that's a different issue. This statement is actually meant to lead to life, not to drive people away from God. This statement is meant there to actually help us focus on how to get to God. And that is simply... Jesus. And also, if you thought about it a little bit logically, if there was another way to get to eternal life, then why would God go through so much trouble to have his son assume human flesh and die on the cross for our sins if he knew there were already many ways to eternal life? You know, the, the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is praying and saying, you know, you know, is there any way this cup can be taken from me? The answer should have been, if there are other ways, sure, I can take that cup away, don't worry. You know, you don't need to go to, onto the cross for the sins of the world. I have plenty of other options. Jesus didn't hear that when he was praying, because Jesus knew he was the only way to deal with our sins. The truth is sin makes it impossible for people to come to God on their own efforts or by their own religious beliefs. The atoning sacrifice of Jesus is the only path to God that could in any way deal with the issue of sin. And therefore, he's indeed the only way to God and to eternal life. Now, that is such an encouraging statement and great opportunities. You know, when someone says, well, how do I have eternal life? John 14, 6. Have a look at John 14, 6. You know, how do I know where I can find the truth? John 14, 6. I mean, if you like to, you know, if you say, oh, I can't remember verses very well, remember John 14, 6. Sing the song. Because it is the answer, as Jesus is the answer, to so many questions. And as I said, this was the answer to Thomas's response. We have no idea. Which, by the way, was a response to Jesus saying a few things. And that was, he said, hey, guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God and trust also me. When you think about it, just prior to this, uh, Jesus has been saying to them, you know, well, first of all, he got up and did the foot washing scene, which totally blew their minds. 
Uh, and then he announced that one of them was going to betray betray him again, going, what? Uh, and then he gives them this new commandment, love, you know, one another. Yep, okay, I can handle that. Yep, I'll get that. Uh, except when Jesus says that, it's way more, way bigger than anything that, you know, they could possibly understand. Uh, it's not just love the people you like. It's love, you know, even your enemies. And then he tells Peter, you're going to deny me. So we come into chapter 14 and and he makes this statement, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's to be highly expected that right at this very moment, they are very troubled about what's going on. And it, it is interesting that Jesus, in knowing that his hour has come, instead of the disciples comforting him, guess what? He is comforting them. He doesn't berate them about having a troubled heart. Uh, it's not a sin to have a troubled heart, to be troubled. Uh, because Jesus was troubled a number of times. Uh, his inner self was upset and he was angered and he was conflicted and saddened at times. And John recalls that for us. And here when his disciples are troubled, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled because he's saying don't, you don't have to stay in that spot. He's saying to his disciples and to us, we don't have to remain in this state. Yeah, you don't have to surrender what's to what's concerning you. Rather, the answer is trust. Not to trust in what you see. After all, we can't see the big picture. But rather, trust in God. And he says to his disciples, trust in me. He's saying that if you believe in God, well, trust God. You've seen me in my ministry, trust me. You know, the answer to a troubled heart is faith, faith and prayer. And this is really at the heart of, for them, a basic question of, do you trust God? Do you trust me? Do you trust me with your future? Do you trust me with that I actually love you and you're going to trust me with your love as well? Do, do you trust me with your life? Do, do you trust God to want the best for you? Do you trust him to talk to him about what's troubling you and following his guidance? For to say, I believe in Jesus is to say, I trust God. And, and that means I do things differently from someone who doesn't trust God. Uh, and, and that difference could be in the way I respond to things. You know, as Christians, when the news comes on, you know, especially if it's something about politics, do we join in with the crowd and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and we have a good grizzle? Or do we go, Lord, you need to give those politicians all the help you can because they need you. And do you say, thank you, Lord, I'm not doing their job. Uh, when when you know, there's all this hype going on, do you step back and say, well, hang on, how would Jesus look at this? And not get caught up in the hyper things. In the way I respond to an issue is meant to be different. Uh, talking to God, you know, prayer and following his guidance rather than just doing what I think is best. Uh, how we respond to life says a lot about how we trust God. Jesus is saying, hey, guys, you're troubled. Don't remain there. Trust in me. And then he goes on and says, <laughs> what, what seems to be a bit of a weird statement, he says, in the house of my father, there are many dwelling places, or as the New Living Translation puts it, there's more than enough room in my father's house. And what he's doing is taking the issues that are troubling them, especially around the fact that, you know, he's about to die and leave them, and he's actually taking them and putting them into a positive context. Uh, is, you know, this was the main reason to trust him. He is securing a place in heaven for them. 
Now, on a side note, uh, the King James uses the term mansions here, um, which unfortunately has sort of become immersed in our popular Christian culture so that, you know, you can hear people saying, well, well yeah, I've got a mansion when I get to heaven. Um, that concept, unfortunately, is not supported by the, the Greek. Uh, it's more Western economic notion. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we don't have prime real estate when we get to heaven. Um, what Jesus is saying is there is a place for you with God that I'm going to go get it ready. Mind you, it's already ready. And then when it's ready, I'll come back and get you. Uh, you know, <laughs> Probably the better image is that you've got an apartment. Yeah, you know, maybe not a very big apartment, but you've got an apartment in God's residence in the New Jerusalem. The main thing is it's not the building, it's the place and the relationship you have with God that Jesus is saying. So he's asking them to trust him. And then he puts it into the question, if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Would I have, you know, would I have done that? Would I have, you know, it, you know, am I the one who you can trust? Now, the answer to that is obviously, Jesus, no, you won't lie to us. I mean, you're the truth for starters. You're not, you're not going to try to trick us in any way. You won't misguide us in any way. Again, he's saying, do you trust? And again, the question is coming up, am I willing to trust Jesus with my life and my future? He goes on and says, when everything is ready, I will come and get you. And now, you know, I like this bit because it's a reminder when everything is ready, not when I want it to be ready or when I think it should happen, uh, or at any other time, it's when everything is ready, then I will come. I, I don't know about you, but have you ever said, Lord, now would be the right time to turn up? Yeah. Yeah. This would be really good, Lord, right now. It means I don't have to deal with that. Yeah. If you came right now, I don't have to deal with that. Well, Jesus says, no, when everything's ready, I'll turn up. And by the way, you will have to deal with that with me together. Jesus is not going to abandon his followers and, and leave them stranded alone. Rather, he'll be the means of coming together in God's presence. Yes, he's going to leave them. There it was the cross to come. There was the tomb to be occupied. But all of that is so that we can actually be with him always. We can be with him where he is. And that's the reason he'll come, so that we can be with him. We can be in the Father's presence with the Son and the Holy Spirit, you know, in the Father's house that we call heaven. And then finally he says, and you know the way to where I'm going. Now Thomas says, no, I haven't got a clue. Neither are these guys with me. We, however, should have a clue because we have this. Hopefully we've been reading it. We know the answer, where he's going. He's going to prepare a place and then come back to take us to that place. That is the promise of the future. So for me, as I look at what is happening here, I see opportunities to speak Christ into my own life. When I am troubled, or when I'm talking with someone who's troubled, uh, that troubled nature could be um, feeling abandoned by God, feeling alone in this crazy world. I can remind myself that I can trust God who is the way, the truth, and the life. When I'm feeling that uh, unwanted, and that could be because I don't 
see my value to God, either because of what I've done in the past or maybe what I'm not doing right now, I can be reminded to trust God because he's gone to prepare a place for me and he will come back for me. You know, doesn't that, does that, wow, that one day Jesus is going to come back for each of us. And if I'm troubled because I'm unsure what's going on again, those words, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Also, trust me. So here's the challenge for us. Do I trust him? Do I really trust him? Do I trust him to leave here and go to Aladala and see what he's going to do there? Do I trust him like Abraham is called to go to another place? Do I trust him when he said to a tax collector, come follow me? Or a fisherman and say, I'll make you fishermen of men. Do I trust him? Let's pray. Lord, every day there are opportunities to exercise our trust in you. Forgive us when we have missed those opportunities. Help us to actually more and more naturally trust you in whatever circumstance we're in. And I pray for the person, actually it probably is not just one Lord, but for all of us who are having huge things that are challenging that, that you will speak into our situation, but more importantly, speak into our hearts and our minds. And that these words, Trust in God and trust in me will resonate. Lord, I know that this week we'll have plenty of opportunity to exercise this. Help us to remember this verse. Actually, Holy Spirit, may it just keep coming up again and again and again and again and again, and again in our head as we face different things. But also, Lord, not just for us, but those around us. For those like Thomas who honestly go, I have no idea. Help us to be able to trust you and speak you into that situation. For family and friends and acquaintances and the stranger that we meet who is troubled. Help us to trust you and speak you into that situation with grace and your love and your mercy. So that they too will be able to say this. Yes, I'm troubled, but I trust in God and I trust in the Lord Jesus. Help us to do that, Lord. Amen.